interview. The Maverick businessman says he took down Bill Shorten and will do the same to Anastasia Palaszczuk as he accuses the Premier of weaponising on borders and the COVID-19 pandemic to be re-elected. We've just got to ask yourself, where would we be if he was? He would have spent all of our money, there'd be no job saver, we wouldn't have been ready for the virus, it all would have gone out the window. So at a critical moment, an important his, uh, moment in history, we acted decisively in the last two weeks of the campaign to guarantee Shifty Short didn't get the job. We didn't do it just for us, we did it for all Australians. How important is this upcoming state election for Queensland? Well, Queensland's in a very bad position at the moment. It sets over $100 million and there's no real hope for people. 10,000 people lost their jobs in the Gold Coast. So putting the virus aside, we've got to get the... Um, Queensland economy moving again. We need a new deal for Queensland. We need a new deal based on enterprise and, and we need to cut the red tape, eliminate payroll tax, uh, eliminate uh, land tax and some of these things to make our state more competitive, more stronger, and provide employment for our people. The current government just can't do that. It doesn't listen to anybody. It's not interested in promoting projects. It's got no uh, idea about wealth creation. So I live in Queensland, so I want to play an important role to bring these issues to the attention of both major parties, and there's no better way to do that than stand in the election. And of course, you have already started campaigning. I've seen a lot of uh, billboards around Brisbane yeah. with, you know, give Labor the boot. Well, it's a simple message. Yeah. It is a simple message. What, I mean, you spend a lot of money to keep Shorten out of the lodge. You're going to spend a fair bit of dough to try and keep Palaszczuk well, uh, out of the premiership? Well, Palaszczuk's rigged the book. She's uh, eliminated how much people can spend in favour of the union movement, but Fortunately, the cost of media has come down dramatically in the last year due to, I think, you know, the virus and the fact of demand. So we've, we've got an adequate, uh, a adequate war chest, and I think we'll be able to get our message across to people that uh, we need a new deal for Queensland. We've got a great state leader in Greg Dowling up there in town, so I'm pretty confident that he'll be elected. He uh, got over 20% when he stood for mayor, and I'm sure people will rally to his support. Now, you spent, uh, as I said, a lot of money at the federal election, but you also spent a lot of money in 2015 campaigning against Campbell Newman. Yeah. You've been on the record and said you regret now that uh, you played a role in his demise because we inherited this Labor government. Uh, do, do you regret that? Well, I think you've got to say that never believe that things can't get worse. And I think in that context, I had differences with Campbell about certain things, but they were certainly magnified under the Palaszczuk government. So in that regard, uh, you know, Queensland's gone backwards, our debt's increased, our public service has blown out, and many of our children don't have any future for themselves or any enterprises to go into. So I'd have to say that was a, that was a bad move. Um, Campbell had his problems about civil liberties, about trying to do things too much and not listening to the community. I think he's probably learned from that. But, um, you know, this is a very serious problem we face in Queensland with our economy teetering on a knife edge, our people in mass unemployment, and what's going to happen when Job Saver kicks out? That's what we've got to worry about. You know, our tourist industry has been decimated in North Queensland. Uh, in central Queensland, we're living in a third world country. And um, we've got to care more about the place we live in. Do you think Premier Palaszczuk has politicised the pandemic? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, if you look at the numbers, and the, and the cost. So if you take our claim in Western Australia, there's uh, nine cases in Western Australia, there's been nine deaths in the last 12 months, but there's been 400 suicides. Eight people a week are committing suicide in Western Australia, and the amount of do domestic violence has increased by 300%. There'd be similar figures here in Queensland. And of course, we've got to be concerned not just about the politics of this, but about our fellow citizens and what it's doing to them. But more importantly, we are a commonwealth. We are one country. And uh, there's a lot of parochialism starting now that I'm in a West Australian, you're a Queenslander, and that's who I am. Well, it's not like the states of Europe. We're one nation. And uh, we'll see that what McGowan has told the people is just not true. I mean, his chief medical officer said he recommended opening the borders and the Premier didn't get back to him. And yet McGowan says all these politicians go out and say, I'm acting on the advice of the chief medical officer. Well, gee, it's not just medical conditions they've been in, elected for. It's to govern the whole state or the whole... Uh, of the, of the Commonwealth, wherever they're acting, for the benefit of the people. Clive, the Prime Minister, I think, started out very well with this pandemic. I mean, yeah. the National Cabinet seemed to be working well, but since Victoria went pear-shaped and we've had uh, McGowan and Palaszczuk's obsession with border control and mm. all those anomalies around the border with, you know, people, sick kids in Lismore, unable to get to Brisbane. Mm. Uh, where's the leadership from the Prime Minister on this? There needs to be more leadership right now on the hard issues, but the reality of it is that what's happening in Victoria is the Labor Party's fault. They uh, incompetently dealt with uh, quarantine from overseas passengers, and 99% of all the virus cases in Victoria are linked to, linked to the Labor Party. 
having a 30,000 person demonstration in the city when they should have been quarantining people. So anything that's happened to Victoria is to do with the Labor Party. What's happening to the economy in Western Australia and Queensland is also blamed at the Labor Party because these people are singly negative about all aspects of life. And you may not, you may not win by being positive, but you've got a chance. If you're being negative, you'll never win. And we've got to make sure that we're winners. Our children are winners and our state's in a stronger position. Clive, I want to talk about a couple of other issues. Now, you've always um, been very uh, aggressive in your defence of Queensland Nickel. Yeah. You, you, you set Queensland Nickel up and, of course, uh, uh, you know, the nickel price dropped and, and you closed it. Um, what do you say to your detractors who mm -hmm. say well, you, you abandoned those workers? Well, the reality of it is that BHP was closing the place in 2008 and 2009 when Anna Bly asked me to see what I could do to save jobs. And for seven or eight years, Clive Mensick worked diligently up there. We invested um, nearly $2 billion in the operation to keep people employed. But then, of course, the nickel price crashed to less than $3.99, about a dollar or so under our production costs, and it just wasn't viable to keep it going any longer. But I think those people um, had jobs for seven or eight years that they otherwise wouldn't have had. They've all been paid out... 100% now, so that the, all this rhetoric you hear is just not true. Now, you mentioned Clive Mensick. Yeah. Uh, he's your nephew, and of course he's, he's in Eastern Europe. Uh, apparently he's in love. He's in love, yeah. You can't get him back. I mean, there, ASIC are chasing him. Have you spoken to him lately? Yeah, I talk to him every day. ASIC are not chasing him. ASIC wouldn't know what they're doing. They're a hopeless organisation. Um, but the reality of it is he's quite happy, and he's doing work with us over there on our Titanic project. Let's talk about the Chinese, uh, in particular the relationship with the United States and Australia. Yeah. Uh, Donald Trump is very angry with the Chinese. He blames the Chinese for his political fortunes at the, the moment. The China virus. Yeah. The China virus, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you're a student of American politics. Yeah. How do you think he's shaping up uh, in November? I think he'll, he'll win. I think he's going well, to be honest with you. Um, um, I had a great friend of mine who's very high up in the Democratic Party of the United States contact me and he said, oh, we're ahead six points over Donald Trump. But I looked up the uh, situation with Hillary Clinton and she was 12 points ahead at that time. So they're not doing it. Joe Biden's not doing as good as Hillary was at the same time. But I think uh, when people are underestimating the violence in the United States, the uh, lack of law and order, and I think that they realise that the Democrats... Uh, and where, where people have died have been with Democratic governors. It hasn't been where there's been Republican administration. So I think you'll see Donald Trump's surprise again. You don't want to believe the media, um, Peter, even though this is a great show. I certainly believe everything you say. Let's talk about you personally, Clive. Um, I mean, you're a larger-than-life character. Everybody in Australia knows who Clive Palmer is. What drives you? Well, uh, this country has been very good to me. I've got a strong commitment to Australia. My uh, families had a strong commitment. In the First World War, uh, I lost my uncle. Uh, he, he died in the First World War. In the Second World War, we had people serving on the Kokoda Trail in Trebrook. I had three of my um, uh, nephews uh, end up as TPI pensioners after the Vietnamese conflict. My other, other nephew, um, squadron leader Martin Brewster, set up the infrastructure for Timor. All those people have done more than I could ever do, give to my country. So we've got a good country in Australia. However hard it is or have a difficulty, we should protect it and defend it. And I'm really concerned at the moment that our federation's breaking up and the parochialism that's come about by people saying, I'm a Western Australian or a Queenslander, I'm not an Australian. That's why it's important that our Section 92 challenge is successful, so we can get the economy going again. Because when JobSaver stops and all this federal government help comes away, what's going to happen to our people? What do you see as your greatest or some of your greatest achievements? Well, I think... Uh, back in the 1970s when we reduced the Labor Party to 11 members in state parliament when I was with the National Party. That was a pretty good achievement. It was Sir Joe. It was Sir Joe. I think it was a good achievement when we got government now and right for the National Parties for two years. I think it was a big achievement for me when I was made a life member of the Liberal National Parties. It was another achievement when a, a, Australians elected me as a living national treasure in 2012. It was another achievement winning a seat in the House of Representatives on the, on the first go, holding the balance of power in Australia. But certainly I take satisfaction with the last federal election because that was a, 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 a very important thing for Australia. And I don't think that the government would have been elected if it wasn't for us. First of all, we had 3.5% vote, which we gave to the government. They had 90% of those preferences. That counted in 20 seats. But moreover, we brought um, Bill Shorten back to reality. People could see what he was. And where would we be as a country today if we had the Labor Party in power and they'd spent that trillion dollars? There'd be no job saver. Uh, this country would be a wreck, and we've got to thank that that didn't happen. 
You're similarly concerned about the re-election of the Palaszczuk government. I am, because um, you know, the Palaszczuk government simply does nothing for Queensland. You know? There's no go forward. There's no real economic plan for the state. And all that happens is our, our bureaucracy gets bigger. The public service has increased nearly 300% from when Campbell Newman left office. And that's non-productive jobs coming from a productive economy. The, uh, the green movement has destroyed the coal industry in Queensland and continues to do so. And our politicians are frightened of them and are trying to stand up for enterprise and jobs in our own state. So, you know, I'm a little bit a supporter of Queensland. I've been here, lived all my life. I've got a strong connection to the land, as our Indigenous people would say. And I think we need to defend it. But, you know, Queensland can do better. When um, I was uh, with Sir Joe, we're the number one in the, in, the, in the Commonwealth in relation to our industrial enterprise. People were coming up here like salmon for Victoria to die and bring their wealth with them to the Gold Coast. There was a booming construction on the Gold Coast. And we've still got all those assets. Well, now we're telling them to stay away, Clive. Well, we are, because we don't want jobs. We don't want wealth. We want to regress down on, on solar energy uh, with high power rates and uh, non-competitive industries and subsidies. But eventually all that will spiral down to the lowest common denominator. It was in 1958 that Australia was a third world country, uh, an undeveloped economy. And we've made great strides in this country, so we've got to try to protect it and defend it. You don't have to be Prime Minister to have a view. You just have to be a citizen. You don't have to uh, be in Parliament to serve the people. There's plenty of good things like Rotary and, and Lions. There's, there's a whole range of ways you can serve our community. But every Australian should look to public service because uh, it really has no reward. History is its only reward, and we've got a great history in this state. Do you think we've seen the last of Jackie Trad? I think so. I think she's a wholly negative person. Um, she never projects anything positively. And she's a remarkably good investor. She just seems to invest in areas where the government's going to build something. So what wonderful judgment she has. So maybe she'll go into investing in areas where the government will be building infrastructure. Who knows what she'll do. But I don't think she's a person of any significance for the country. And just finally, what are the challenges for you personally going forward over the next 10 years and also for Queensland and the country? Well, my biggest challenge every day is keeping my wife happy. Because, you know, a happy wife is a happy life, you know. And I'm fortunate to be in love with my wife, and I have been for a long time. And uh, she puts up with me, right? And uh, so I don't ever want to be the situation that I found one of my friends back in the 1980s who'd been in the Navy for 20 years. He'd retired, I think he was 75 at that time. And every day I'd find him in the United Services Club looking at papers in the morning. And I said, Bill, what are you doing? He said, well, my wife said she married me, but not for lunch. So he had to go out every day to two o'clock and come home. She married him, but not for lunch. So I hope my wife will keep me for lunch as well. You know? But that's my biggest personal challenge. But I'm very fortunate to have a good family and to be happy from that part of life. But my other challenge is to see what we can do to help our community to get back on its feet, to have more enterprise, and to do all that we can to make Australia and, and Queensland a better place. And do you think you'll ever stand for Parliament again? I don't think so. I'm a retired parliamentarian. One term's enough, I can tell you that. <laughs> you know? What did you think of your stint in Canberra? What did you, I mean, it gave you an opportunity to, to, to look up yeah. close, get up close and personal with the way the political system operates. Well, certainly, especially when we had the balance of power, because we had a really significant mm. position there. But there's one famous senator uh, that's known for her, her support of children in different situations, if you know who I mean. And uh, we, with Scott Morrison, it was our votes that put through the Chev visas, safe enterprise visas, which, which is an idea I came up with. And I did a deal with uh, Morrison when he was um, the immigration minister that he'd release 1,100 children, I think it was, uh, 1,500 people on Christmas Island, 500 of them children, and that the 30,000 odd refugee cases in Australia, if they went somewhere in a rural area, looked after themselves, got a job, and, the, and they could prove that they weren't depending on the Commonwealth, they could apply for another visa after five years rather than just having a safe enterprise visa where they could be in the cities. And I sat down with that particular senator one night and, and a, another member of the Labor Party to explain what the legislation was. And I said, look, you'll like this because, you know, 500 children will be released on, from Christmas Island. And she looked at me and she said, who cares about the little buggers? She said, we've just got to stop Abbott, right? When she said that, my chief of staff resigned. He said, I can't take this place any longer. Because her public profile was being all caring about the children, right? And in reality, she wasn't. So this is the contradiction you get with politicians. They're like the Queen. Their main argument is to stay there, right? To, to keep in power. That's all they really care about. They don't really care about the truth 
lies or anything like that. So it's a bit of a madhouse. And of course, they all hated me because um, I just said what I thought and uh, I wasn't worried about the consequence. I donated my whole salary to charity. Um, and I, I was prepared to deal with difficult issues. And, uh, you know, so I got, I got lambasted because I wouldn't go along with the crew. But that's the system. That's the system we've got in Australia. As Winston Churchill said, democracy is probably the best system we've got. You know, it's, it's better than uh, the alternative.